Good morning, St. Peter's. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Really good to see you. Um, yeah, just say hello to someone next to you. Someone that you may know or may not know, someone behind you. Just say hello to someone this morning. Welcome them. Hello. Hello. <laughs> now, I'm partially doing that because we're saying goodbye in some degree to the wave. As we know, I actually watched, I wasn't here last week, but I did watch the service online. And uh, welcome to anybody who's watching us online this morning, joining in, welcome. Um, and Andrew was obviously talking about how we're going back to some form of, I don't know, is it normality? What we used to do, where we used to go around and shake people's hands. Hopefully at some point we'll get back to hugging each other. That'd be lovely. But um, so I feel like we should say goodbye to some degree to the wave. Um, but it was lovely to think that actually that's what we're here for as church, isn't it? To be able to extend the hand out to somebody, whether it's someone we know, someone we don't know, and say welcome. So uh, we're looking forward to getting back to that. So who's booked a holiday? Come on, who's booked a holiday? Who started a diet? Oh, good, well done. Who's, who's failed a diet? <laughs> who's got new resol resolutions that they've started and they've stopped already? I don't actually do new resolutions because they're just too much pressure. It's too much pressure. Um, and actually, I don't think I've ever really liked a new year. Um, we did talk about this a little bit at the uh, January the 1st service, but I think it's from years of being in business and you get to the beginning of the new year and think, oh, Christmas is over. And then it's just, what is the next year going to hold? What's it going to be like? And I think there's always a degree of trepidation thinking, is it going to be better? Is it going to be worse? But that whole thing of the whole year rolling out. Um, and there's always going to be challenges, let's face it. You know, now more than ever, there's more and more challenges. And I'm going to share um, something that I'm going to be stepping into new this year at the end of the service. Um, but the amazing thing about facing challenges is we don't do it on our own. We don't need to do it on our own. So if you're facing something this morning, maybe you've come to church with something on your mind, something on your heart, or you know someone who is struggling, um, can I encourage you to share that with someone, someone that you trust? You don't have to do it now necessarily, you don't have to do it over coffee, but we're all here for each other, you know, warts and all. What I think is amazing about the Holy Spirit is he brings all these people together who perhaps would not be together in any other context, but that is such a joy. So... We're here as church family for that reason. So if there's something you're going through, have courage. Speak to someone you know, maybe your house group, maybe Andrew or somebody else you know within the church. Have a coffee, have a glass of Keir, as I do at Honours regularly, on the pretense of business, but it usually is, isn't it, Honour? But we share life together. Um, and often, I don't know about you, the, the, often the last thing we do is pray about it. Maybe that's just me. Um, so if ever you wanted to pray about something, there's always space here to come either to the front or to me or to anybody you know who, who is someone who would pray for in the church and just sit and pray with somebody about it or sit in silence with someone about it. And there's also a Monday evening prayer group that meets faithfully every Monday evening to pray for the needs of the village, people we know, someone's auntie's uncle's friend. They are, I think, the engine room of prayer in this church. So if you've got anything, it's always in confidence. Please do feel you can go to that that group you can come through me again or Andrew or any of the PCC in and pass that prayer group on but please do pray just get someone to pray with you and so with that in mind let's come together in mind body and spirit as we pray together as church so please join in the words in bold we gather a community of faith in God's subversive world we gather to celebrate that no darkness can extinguish light to remember that love will always be more powerful than death, and to trust that peace will always be stronger than violence. We gather, people of faith in the light of God's word, we gather to worship. So we're gonna gather and have our time of sung worship. If you're new to the church and this is something you haven't experienced before, we're gonna sing, the words are on the screen. I thought I had a, had a plan B in case the screen didn't work, but it's fine now. Um, Please do join in as much as you're able to, as you want to. You can, I encourage you to stand, but don't feel you have to stand. If you want to sit, please do. Let's just spend time opening our heart up to God.
Thank you, Lord, that you are God eternal. God eternal with us here this morning. We praise you, we worship you, we adore you. Come, Holy Spirit. Amen. Please do sit down. One thing I always forget to do when I lead is I always forget to say my name. Hi, I'm Lizzie. <laughs> I know most of you know that, but apologies. I'm Lizzie and I'm one of the church leaders here at St. Peter's, amongst other things. So I'm going to invite Pat up for her Bible, for the Bible reading. Now, I have, Pat and I have a... <laughs> Last time I did Bible readings for Pat, I got the slide wrong and gave her a completely different reading, which is my fault. This time I've only got one reading wrong, so I'm actually improving, which is good. <laughs> So, contrary to what the slide says, Pat will not be reading both those readings. She's reading Isaiah 49, 1 to 7, and John 1, 29 to 42. Please do come up, Pat. So, Isaiah 49, 1 to 7. Listen to me, all you distant lands. Pay attention, you who are far away. The Lord called me before my birth. From within the womb, he called me by name. He made my words of judgment as sharp as a sword. He has hidden me in the shadow of his hand. I'm like a sharp arrow in his quiver. He said to me, you are my servant, Israel, and you will bring me glory. I replied, but my work is so useless. I've spent my strength for nothing and for no purpose. Yet I leave it all in the Lord's hand. I will trust God for my reward. And now the Lord speaks, the one who formed me in my mother's womb to be his servant, who commissioned me to bring Israel back to him. The Lord has honoured me and my God has given me strength. He says... You will do more than restore the people of Israel to me. I will make you a light to the Gentiles, and you will bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. The Lord, the Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, says to the one who is despised and rejected by the nations, to the one who is the servant of rulers, kings will stand at attention when you pass by. Princes will also bow low because of the Lord, the faithful one, the Holy One of Israel, who has chosen you. And I'm going to read from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, beginning to read at verse 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Look, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. He is the one I was talking about when I said, A man is coming after me who is far greater than I am for he existed long before me I did not recognize him as the Messiah but I've been baptizing with water so that he might be revealed to Israel then John testified I saw the Holy Spirit descending like a dove from heaven and resting upon him I didn't know he was the one but when God sent me to baptize with water he told me, the one on whom you see the Spirit descend and rest is the one who will baptise with the Holy Spirit. I saw this happen to Jesus, so I testify that he is the chosen one of God. The following day, John was again standing with two of his disciples. As Jesus walked by, John looked at him and declared, look, there's the Lamb of God. When John's two disciples heard this, they followed Jesus. Jesus looked round and saw them following. What do you want? He asked them. They replied, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come and see, he said. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon when they went with him to the place where he was staying and they remained with him the rest of the day. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of these men who followed Jesus. Andrew went to find his brother Simon and told him, we have found the Messiah, which means the Christ. Then Andrew brought Simon to meet Jesus. Looking intently at Simon, Jesus said, your name is Simon, 
son of John, but you will be called Cephas, which means Peter. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. I'm going to invite Andrew up now to, to bring us his take on those passages. Thanks, Andrew. Good morning. Let's just uh, take a moment to pray together. May I speak in the name of God, the giver of life in all its fullness, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. There are, sadly, various indications that I'm getting older. Some can't be missed, like becoming a grandfather, but some are subtler, like my bones creaking rather more conspicuously than they used to. And very occasionally, the odd name may just elude me for a moment or two. But I've recently noticed another odd development. It seems that the subject of obituaries and eulogies is beginning to crop up from time to time as part of everyday conversation. The most recent example of this was last week. I was having a perfectly normal conversation with my wife, Louise, when she suddenly said, if you're going to do the eulogy at my funeral, please don't start it by saying, Louise was born on October the 18th, 1960. I was slightly stunned, but I politely inquired why such a factually accurate opening should be avoided. And it transpires that, as a writer by profession, Louise feels that telling the story of a life should not have to faithfully start with life's first cry and finish with its final breath. A life story, it seems, can be put together in many ways and even leave out a substantial part of the everyday information. The focus can then be on those things that best illustrate the richness of the life in question. And interestingly, it seems that this insight was fully embraced by the Apostle John, the author of our passage this morning, which is from the Gospel of John, chapter 1. John's biography of the life of his friend Jesus opens with a brief but stunning philosophical reflection on Jesus as the Word of God. And then John begins his story about Jesus with an entirely different character, the austere prophet John the Baptist. And Jesus is simply presented as a passing figure in this first chapter. And when he appears, he is already a grown man of around 30 years old. So consistent with Louise's thesis of how to write a life story, the Apostle John has ignored the greater part of Jesus' life, starting only at the beginning of his ministry, the beginning of the world-changing richness of his final few years. And from our passage, I want to look at the short conversation between two of John the Baptist's disciples and Jesus. It's a conversation which starts at John chapter 1, verse 35. And it's reasonable to assume that this conversation happens at Bethany, a small village where the other gospel writers tell us that John the Baptist was giving people a baptism of repentance and it was the place at which Jesus himself was baptized. This site has not been clearly identified, but it must have been by the River Jordan, fairly obviously, and was probably on the eastern side of the river, a few kilometers north of the Dead Sea. And Bethany was most likely just a hamlet, but it's fair to say that with the presence of the famous prophet John the Baptist at the river, it had become something of well, I was going to say something of a Mecca, <laughs> but perhaps it would be more appropriate to say it had become something of a honeypot for the spiritually curious of the time. And on the day that I'm looking at, John the Baptist wasn't preaching to crowds. We are told that he's alone with just two of his disciples. One of the two disciples is unnamed, but the other is identified as Andrew. As they're talking, Jesus passes by and is identified by John the Baptist as the Lamb of God. 
We'll talk a little later about the substance of the conversation between Jesus and these two men. But when I first read through the passage, the phrase that particularly struck me is actually at the end of verse 39, just at the point where the two men head off with Jesus to spend the rest of the day with him. And the phrase that grabbed my attention simply says, it was about the 10th hour, or as the NIV translates it, it was about four in the afternoon. Why are we told the time? Why do we need to know whether they spent the day with Jesus from the 10th hour or the 5th hour? After all, there's a load of information we aren't given in this passage. Why was Jesus there? Was he traveling with anybody? How long had Andrew and his friend been with John the Baptist? There is so much information that we aren't given. Why tell us what time of day it was? Well, to you and me, it's a mildly interesting surplus fact. But just imagine that this memory, just imagine that this is a memory of a key event in your life, a moment that literally changed your whole destiny. The whole event would be etched in your memory, including just what time of day it was, the moment at which your life changed forever. So I want to suggest to you that this remark in our passage is a hint that the second unnamed disciple was the Apostle John himself, the author of the Gospel. This little detail about the time of day is the type of detail that would be included if the author was actually part of the story being described. So we can read this passage as an account by the author John of the day that changed his life the day when he met Jesus for the first time and became his disciple. So imagine for a moment that you are John in this passage. You and your friend Andrew have come from Bethsaida, a long way away north of the Sea of Galilee. You've joined the followers of John the Baptist, impressed by his message of repentance and convicted of your failure to adequately obey the laws of the Torah. But as you continue to learn, you hear John the Baptist say he is a herald to a much greater prophet than him. Just yesterday, you were with John the Baptist in a crowd of people, and he pointed to an approaching figure and spoke of him as one that surpasses John the Baptist himself. But before you can really take note of this man, he's gone. You talked to Andrew that evening about this encounter. Who is this person that the wild and magnificent prophet is pointing out? Nobody seems to know who he is. You resolve with Andrew that if you get the opportunity, you'll seek this person out and find out more. The following day, you are fortunate enough to be able to spend time, just you and Andrew, with John the Baptist. He's a fascinating man, passionate and holy, beyond anything that you've come across before. And then suddenly he is distracted by a figure over your shoulder. Behold, the Lamb of God, he says. You turn round and see the same figure that he pointed to yesterday. It's time for a key decision. Do you cut short this time with the great prophet John the Baptist so you can seek out this strange passing figure to which he points? The Lamb of God starts to walk away. You and Andrew remember your conversation of the previous evening. You mustn't let him disappear again. With a glance to Andrew, you take your leave from John the Baptist and hurry after the figure who is going back towards the village. You walk quickly and gain on him until you're just a few yards behind him. The Lamb of God suddenly turns around and you see those eyes for the first time. Eyes that seem not only to see into your deepest secrets, but at the same time to communicate unfathomable love. But you also hear for the first time one of those questions that Jesus asks, questions that spin your head around. What are you looking for, he asks. What a question, just the right question, not who are you looking for, but what are you looking for? What am I looking for, you think? I've come all this way because I'm searching for something. I've ended up following John the Baptist, but what is it that I'm looking for? 
Am I looking for new teaching? Or to find a leader who will overthrow the Romans? Or, or perhaps I'm seeking some answers about life itself, a purpose. Or maybe I'm even seeking something beyond this life. You have to concede to yourself that you have no easy answer to Jesus' question. And in his kind but penetrating eyes, you recognize that he too sees your confusion and your lack of an answer. You glance at Andrew, and it's plain that he is struggling too, but he has remembered why you followed this man, and he blurts out, Rabbi, where are you staying? Of course, you and Andrew just want to spend some time with this new rabbi to find out about him. Perhaps he will give you the opportunity to visit him tomorrow. But to your joy, Jesus' response is much more than a future invitation. Come, he says, now with smiling eyes. Come and you will see. The double meaning in those words is not lost on you. Yes, you will see where he is staying, but you know that this is an invitation to explore the confusion caused by his first question. Come with me, Jesus is saying, and you'll no longer be in confusion about what you seek. You will begin to see plainly. Come, and you will see. The passage doesn't tell us where Jesus was staying, but we do know that the lives of John and Andrew were changed forever by the conversation that they had there. Andrew later simply says to his brother Simon, we have found the Messiah. In many ways, the pattern by which Jesus selected and taught his disciples follows the Jewish practice of the time. First century rabbis typically had a number of disciples. They were known as Talmudin. These Talmudin applied and were selected for the role. Now, this wasn't a simple student-teacher relationship going to classes and learning lessons. Tamadin weren't expected to just learn the lessons, they were expected to become what their rabbi was. So a Talmud followed his rabbi everywhere, every day. Every hour of the day a Talmud would stay with his rabbi to learn from him and to imitate him. A Talmud rarely left his master's side for fear that he would miss a teachable moment. He watched the rabbi's every movement, noting how he acted and thought in every situation. Talmudin trusted their rabbi completely and sought to incorporate his actions and attitudes, not just his words, into their lives. A Talmud's deepest desire was to follow his rabbi so closely that he would start to think and act just like his rabbi. So in many ways, Jesus was finding students to follow him in just the same way as other rabbis of the time, but with an important difference. Normally, a rabbi would receive applications to become a Talmud from able candidates who had been learning about the Holy Scriptures and the law as the core of their education. He would interview them and select only the best of the best. The more renowned the rabbi the higher the bar was set. When God himself became a rabbi, he didn't select applications from the best of the best, those on whom lavish education had been expended. He invited, without application, ordinary folk like Andrew and John. Sometimes he invited the downright mediocre, and sometimes even the socially excluded. You see, those who were poor and had no education couldn't normally become a Talmud. Even with education, those who were less able would fall by the wayside. And even among those who were both educated and able, only a small proportion could become Talmudin. But to become Jesus' Talmud, you didn't have to achieve a standard. You didn't need to have money. You didn't need to be the best of the best. You simply needed to be invited. You simply needed to say yes. Jesus, kingdom, uh, Jesus was God's kingdom rule breaking into the world. To become his Talmud meant discovering the life of the kingdom for yourself. 
but the invitation was inclusive. You didn't need to be part of the elite. You just needed to be willing. And that's the way it remains today. To be a disciple of Jesus, you don't have to have read all the books and memorized all the verses. You don't need to have done anything special. In fact, you may have done some things that you deeply regret. But the invitation is still extended. And we simply have to be willing to step away from our past and to walk into a new future, exploring the kingdom where God rules. We need to want to spend our lives in the company of our Rabbi Jesus, learning to become like him. Like Andrew and John, we need to seek out Jesus, despite the attractions of other spiritual options. Having found him, we need to dedicate ourselves to following and learning. In our passage, Jesus only says two sentences, both of which are deeply relevant to us. As followers of Jesus, like John and Andrew, we hear the question asked, what are you looking for? We recognize our own mixed motives and confusion in the face of that question. This we're told by the society around us that there's only one answer to that question. We're told that we should be looking for happiness. Having been convinced that happiness is the only thing worth seeking, we're then bombarded with our world's vacuous answers about happiness, how happiness can be found. We're told to seek the lifestyle we see in the adverts, to aspire to the glamour of the latest celebrity, to become rich, to seek positions of status and power. We must stay in the safest, risk-free places, and perhaps above all, we must have the admiration of our neighbours. I think there's a lot of truth in the ideas of the French philosopher Girard, who says that people are in large part driven by a desire to have what others have, and also by a desire to be admired for having the things that others want. Girard suggests that we think that it is having things and experiences that our neighbours envy that will make us happy. The house, the exotic holidays, the interesting friends, the perfect family. But in our hearts we know that such happiness is an empty thing. We see it slip through the fingers of people who look to have it all, but are stunned when they discover they have nothing of value. Their lives, like so many others, are just endless, restless, aimless, and searching. They don't really know the answer to Jesus' question to Andrew and John. What are you looking for? We need to understand that the answer to Jesus' question is about our whole lives. If we accept Jesus' invitation to come and see, to become his disciples, his promise is that we will come to understand what we are seeking and find those things that are truly fruitful. But let's not pretend that this is an easy option that can be fitted in alongside the rest of our lives. As real disciples, we must be willing to follow Jesus wherever he leads us. We must be willing to spend every moment in his presence, coming to know him through the Spirit of God. Like good Talmudin, we must be prepared to trust him completely and work passionately to incorporate his words, actions and attitudes into our lives. Our deepest desire must be to follow our rabbi so closely that over time and through the guidance of the Holy Spirit, we begin to think and act like him. Like Andrew and John, we may not be very clear about what we're looking for. But like Andrew and John, we must nevertheless seek out our Lord and respond wholeheartedly to his invitation to follow him. Jesus' challenging question to us is the same as the one he asked Andrew and John. What are you looking for? Jesus' challenging invitation to us is the same as the one he gave on that afternoon that John remembered so vividly. Come and you will see. 
when the story of our lives is finally told in eulogy or obituary, will the tale be so rich that everyday details can be set aside to make space for the rich and wonderful story of our walk with Jesus? As we travel with Jesus as our teacher, what full and fruitful ways of living will we discover? What answer will we find to the question, what are you looking for? Jesus says to each one of us, come and you will see. Amen. So it would be very easy now, wouldn't it, just to rush on and get on to the next part of the service, but I really want to, to rest in those words. What are you looking for? When I was praying with Andrew this, before the service, I really sensed that God wanted us to rest. And Andrew was talking about a restlessness. And there really is a restlessness, isn't there, in society? I don't know if you see it. People are distracted by things, constantly looking for the next thing to distract. And I thought we might take a few moments now just to ask God, each of us individually, what am I looking for? And to, and to pray for that sense of rest. So let's just take a few moments. Ask the Holy Spirit to come. And to see what is in our hearts, what are we looking for? Jesus says, come to me all of you who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. Thank you Jesus that you invite us to come and see. Lord I pray that you would open our spiritual eyes and our physical eyes to where you are, maybe in the background of our lives, maybe in the foreground. But Lord open our eyes to see where you are walking with us before us and behind us. Lord, give us eyes to see you, to see your kingdom, to see others. Thank you that your invitation is always there ready. Jesus, when we Make a mistake. Help us to turn to look at you again with those eyes that smile at us and say, come and you will see. Lord, we come. In Jesus' name, amen. So Liz is going to come now and lead us our prayers called Prayers for the People and then she's going to lead us in the Lord's Prayer straight away afterwards. Thanks, Liz.
Let us pray for the church and for the world and let us thank God for his goodness. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, you promised through your Son, Jesus Christ, to hear us when we pray in faith. Lord, strengthen that faith. Help us to feel your presence here at this moment in this place where we have come to worship you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the Christian church throughout the world. As we approach the week of prayer for Christian unity, we pray for Christians of all denominations who are persecuted because of their faith and ask for your blessing on those who support them. We ask your blessing on all clergy in our diocese. We ask you to strengthen and guide them as they lead their congregations throughout our area. Give them courage, strength, and a real sense of your presence beside them as they seek to spread your word. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We ask your guidance for all those in positions of power and influence throughout the world, where there is so much uncertainty and confusion. We hear of wars and threats of war. We long so much for the peace and goodwill amongst the nations of the world. In your mercy, open the hearts of all rulers and leaders to a realisation of your peace and love. Take from them the lust for power, greed and intolerance, that your kingdom may come upon this earth. Peace reign and your will be done. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Lord, we are truly grateful for all the gifts you have given us, and we pray for those in other parts of the world who do not have even the necessities of life which we so often take for granted. Safe homes, sufficient food, clean water, access to medical treatments and freedom to live life as they choose. We pray for all who are caught up in the horrors of war, who have seen their loved ones killed or maimed, who have had to flee from their homes and seek refuge in places where no one wants them who have given up all hope of being able to live a peaceful life again. Be with them, Lord, in their grief and distress. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father God, we bring before you the problems that we encounter in our own country and which are causing hardship and worry to so many people. Difficulties with our National Health Service, transport, education and government departments. We pray that you will give your wisdom to those in authority, that they may make the right decisions and conflicts be settled quickly and peaceably. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, we pray for family and colleagues, friends and lovers, for neighbours and strangers, for those with whom we meet at work, in the church and our community. 
Help us to think of those less fortunate than ourselves, of the homeless, the hungry, the lonely, those who live in fear, those who are sick and in pain, and those recently bereaved. We pray for all who are going through times of trouble, some perhaps in our families, some in our church, some in our wider circle of friends. Touch with your generous love all who are on our minds today because of their special need, whose names we bring before you now in the silence of our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We remember with deep gratitude those who have left their mark on our lives by giving us love and laughter, but have now gone before us to be with Christ. We hold them in our hearts, knowing that you hold them in yours. Lord, according to your promises, grant us, with them, a share in your eternal kingdom. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And now, as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thank you, Liz. Thanks, Liz. So when we're putting a service together, there's lots of different ways you can put different parts of the service in. And the confession can go in all different places in the service. And I often think, why does it go in one place? Why does it go in another? And, and as you'll find out, if you're here next week when I'm preaching, I found a new understanding of the word repentance. And also, when I remember looking at the word confession, what does that mean? It sounds like, oh, I've got to say something I'm really terrible at, or I've, got, I've been really bad. And yet, actually, it's about saying, God, you know, I agree, God, I've got this wrong. It's about agreeing with God that we perhaps haven't done things we'd like to have done, or haven't acted the way we wish we had acted. It's about coming before God and saying, yeah, you know, you're right, I got that wrong. So in that, um, in that vein, let's come before God now and not come with a sense of um, beating ourselves up, but actually knowing we want to come before God who is holy and righteous and yet loves us just as we are. So please do join in the words in bold. Father, we come to confess. Despite the light before us showing us your way, we have fallen and strayed again. Ever dependent on the grace of God, let us affirm our brokenness and trust God's goodness to carry us through to a new day of possibilities and hope. Loving God, who gave his son as a lamb for the sins of the world, you sent John the Baptist to point to your son, but too often we abandon his message and point only to ourselves. We point to our worship preferences rather than the God we worship. We point to our status rather than the grace that makes us all equal. We point to our values rather than the one who has always valued everyone. We point to our traditions rather than the one who calls us to let go. We point to our past rather than to the one 
who calls us into the future. Forgive us, Lord, for pointing in all the wrong directions. Forgive us when we do not wait patiently for your direction. Hold our gaze on your baptismal promise, sealed in the life, death, and resurrection of your Son. Through the power of your Spirit, give us the courage to speak what we have seen and point to the one who takes away the sins of the world. And this is the great part, isn't it? That we can receive that forgiveness. And the God who forgives us and keeps us in his light, whose nature is always to have mercy, offers us his forgiveness now as we walk again with him in the light. Amen. I'm just going to hand over to Andrew now to take us through the family meal. Thank you, Lizzie. Uh, we're going to share the peace now. And the peace is an essential part of our service, of our worship. And we should all seek to do this. Shaking each other's hands, welcoming each other is about valuing each other and honoring that each of us is made in the image of God. And its very physicality is important. However, for some, sharing the peace is not quite as straightforward as for others. Maybe you've got someone poorly at home. Or maybe you've just had a rubbish week <laughs> and are feeling really fragile. There are a host of really good and valid reasons why sharing the peace by shaking hands is not appropriate for people like that today. And that's wonderful. So, we have a new protocol. Peace protocol, okay? So, what we do is, if you want to share the peace, if you're able to share the peace, could you put your hand out? Then people know that you want to share the peace. Okay? It's like hailing a bus. That's what you do. If no one is sharing the peace with you, maybe it's because you haven't put your hand up. Okay? No one likes me. Well, maybe nobody does like you. But if you put your hand up, they'll know that you want to share the peace. And that's a lovely thing to do. But we need to be sensitive. Because for some, it is difficult. And we know that. If you're able, would you like to stand? Christ came and proclaimed the gospel. Peace to those who are far off. And peace to those who are near. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Would you like to put your hand out if you'd like to share the peace? Alan, peace be with you. Pat, peace be with you. Peace be with you, my sister. Michael, peace be with you. We're going to sing, we're going to sing, worthy is the lamb, as we prepare to take bread and wine together. Also, this is a time where we take a collection, so if you've got money that you'd like to give to the church, we'll take it, and we'll use it really wisely. Let's stand, remain standing, and sing, worthy is the lamb.
Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price you paid. Bearing all my sin and shame, in love you came and gave amazing grace. Thank you for this love. like to remain standing as we have the family meal. And so what I want to do is encourage you to come. If you believe this, welcome to the family meal. And in a moment, I'm going to break wine and... Break wine? No. I'm going to break bread and I'm going to pour wine, one of the two. And then I'll come forward and I'll have the wafers. And I just... Someone will come to the end of your row and point to your row and you just come out. You come out the front and you go back by the side and I will dip the wafer into the wine and place it in your hand, and you just eat it, and then go back to your seat that way. Come not because you deserve it, but because we need it. Also, we're going to sing a Sanctus. Um, we sang it before. Um, uh, we sang it before Christmas. So, if you if you're new, let me just sing it for you now. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. And so we take bread and we take wine. Love revealed in sacrifice. Look upon us in mercy and not in judgment. Draw us from hatred to love. Make the frailty of our praise a dwelling place for your glory.
Amen. The Lord be with you. It is right to praise you, Father, Lord of all creation, for in your love you made us for yourself. When we turned away, you did not reject us, but came to meet us in your Son. You embraced us as your children and welcomed us to sit and eat with you. In Christ you shared our life, that we might live in him and he in us. He opened his arms of love upon the cross and made for all the perfect sacrifice for sin. On the night he was betrayed, at supper with his friends, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take it, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His body is the bread of life. At the end of supper, taking the cup of wine, he gave you thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His blood is shed for all. As we proclaim his death, and celebrate his rising in glory, send your Holy Spirit that this bread and this wine may be to us the body and blood of your dear Son. As we eat and drink these holy gifts, send this one, our risen Lord. So with your whole church throughout the world, we offer you this, our sacrifice of praise, and lift our voice to join the eternal song of heaven. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. Every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. God's holy gifts for God's holy people. Jesus Christ is holy. Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Please sit down, everyone, and someone will appear at the end of your row.
So let's pray our prayer after communion together, shall we? Fill us, good Lord, with your spirit of love, and as you have fed us with the one bread of heaven, so make us one in heart and mind, in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Um, we're going to just take a moment before our final song to um, have some notices. Uh, and we've got two for you today. Firstly, thank you so much to everyone who's inquired about PCC. Uh, that's brilliant. Uh, we need more. So can we have more? Also, um, there is a church warden out there. God has called one of us to be church warden, and it's not me. Um, church warden is kind of a mother or father of the church. Um, and we really need one to step forward uh, as, um, as our wonderful Janice comes to the end of her term. Um, and uh, so could you pray, please? If it's not you, pray really hard that the other person would stand up, <laughs> or it might just be you. Please pray for that. And also, um, Liz has got some really important news to share. Would you like to just share this? First of all, more importantly than what I'm going to say afterwards is we need to pray for PCC. Yay. So it's PCC, the church uh, council committee that meets every other month. We're meeting tomorrow night, so please do pray. Please always pray for the PCC. You know, we're the leaders of the church, but the whole church essentially makes the decisions. So please do pray that we have a, a real sense of unity and that we, um, we make the right decisions regarding this church. And then my announcement is, so many of you will know that I am training to be a vicar. Um, I am in my second year um, and I'm now officially allowed to announce that I am going to my new curacy uh, in July of this year, uh, which is going to be in Bawtry. So Bawtry, if any of you know, is up the 614. You actually go through a sign that says, welcome to Yorkshire, <laughs> but it is the very top end of our diocese. <laughs> so our diocese so extends right into the top part of Yorkshire, essentially. So I'm going to um, work with the lady called Becky, who is the vicar there. She is the vicar of five churches. It's called the River Idol Benefice. You can look it up. The website's not very good. Sorry, Becky. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I'm going to, I'll be going up there. I'll finish here at the end of June, beginning of June. And I'll be going up there to do another two years. So I've done my theological training at college and done the work I've been working at here. And then I'll be doing essentially, I guess it's an apprentice's job. Is that what you'd call it? Yeah. Apprentice essentially for two years minimum. And then who knows from then on. But I would like you all, if you would, just pray for me. Um, it's a huge move. It's a huge thing to do. Um, and I couldn't do it if I wasn't, hadn't been part of this church where you have all encouraged me and loved me and helped me. And I'm so grateful for all of you. So for the next six months, the final leave in June, please do continue to pray for me. Um, I'd love to take any of your wisdom with me. Um, Yes, yeah, so I would just invite people. I've invited these people to pray for me, but please, if anyone else wants to get up and pray for me, please don't feel shy to come to the front and pray for me. Okay. Okay. So let's pray, everyone, shall we? Father God, we thank you so much for Lizzie. Uh, she has been such um, a symbol and a sign and the reality of your grace with us here. And we will miss her dreadfully. But Father, we are thank you that you are calling her on and that her going is an act of obedience. So we pray you pour your blessing upon her. We pray for wonderful new friends. We pray for development of ministry and grace. We pray that she would have great fun and fulfillment. <clears throat> but most of all, she would see you and know your presence. Yes. Father, we pray for your great blessing upon her and we pray for your grace upon us as we miss her. For we ask this all in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. 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 Thank you. Amen. Thank, you Thank you, everybody. Thank you. And uh, just one thing I'd, I'd really like to say to you is all, is if, if you ever think, you know, where is God working in my life? I am a living testimony that God is working in your lives. Because the way that you have all been with me as a person, how I've grown, how I've developed, how I've changed, I wouldn't be able to follow this calling if it wasn't for the people like you around me who have really encourage me to do this so please know that god is working in all of your lives too amen thank, thank you, you. <laughs>
Yes, I can remember Andrew saying to me when I was, I don't know, I've been here about two years, maybe three years, and Andrew said to me, he sat on that back chair, that bit of pew there, and said to me, have you ever thought about ordained ministry? And I thought, no. What is that? I don't know what you mean. And never even considered it. So, so yes, some of us, I might be called to this particular role, but each person here is called to be a part of God's church in whatever context that lo- looks like, whatever it looks like. So yes, I'm here to prove you wrong. <laughs> I love so we're going to sing our final song, and then Andrew's going to give us a blessing. So please do stand for our final song. say our closing prayer together. We have celebrated together that Jesus Christ came not only for us, but to be known by every person, every country, every culture on earth, for he is the saviour of all. May we come to know him better and then make him known to others, especially by the way we live. Amen. Remember, please don't rush off if we can help at all or we can pray for you. I would love to pray for you, especially if you've got a decision to make this week and you want some wisdom. I would love to pray with you. So with Lizzie, don't rush off. Also, stay, stay behind for the coffee and cakes or I'll eat them all. And so may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest upon you and remain with you always. Amen. And may Almighty God bless us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us go in the peace of Christ and walk in his light. Thanks be to God. Amen. 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 Thank you, everybody.